Welcome to Weekend Office Hours with Professor Paul Denary. My name is Sarish Polisani, and here we are again talking about the latest developments in this war in Ukraine. And the past couple of weeks have been fast and furious with uh, the developments. And so uh, last we spoke, Ukraine had scored some huge victories on the battlefield. And now the biggest news is Putin seems to be in a very precarious position. He called for the partial mobilization of 300,000 Russian citizens. Before we get into that, I just want to give a brief backdrop because the way he did it, he was scheduled to speak on primetime live. And, you know, he tells the news channels he's about to come up. uh, They block out the time for him and he doesn't show up. And, And it gets postponed to the next day and a recording comes on where he talks about this. That in itself seems to be a signal but expand on this, Paul. What is going on right now with Putin and Russia? Well, we, we don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, to get to the backdrop, right, Ukraine made these big gains in, in Kharkiv Oblast in particular over the last few weeks. And it really pointed out the fact that that um, for the thousand mile front Ukraine, uh, Russia has, it just doesn't have enough troops to really defend the entire front that it's created. And so it it, it created this question of, of how you're going to deal with it. And, and this is his answer. Yeah, this whole thing where they say, OK, primetime address coming up, president live. And then they say, never mind. And instead, the next morning, not in primetime at all, they um, just release a video of him speaking. We, of course, we don't know. This is what makes Putin so much fun. It's what makes this like, you know, studying Brezhnev in 1982. Uh, what's the guy up to? Um I can speculate on a couple of things. One is is that they were hashing out the details until the very last minute and just ran out of time. I, and I think that points to uh, the amount at which they're sort of improvising and making this up as they go along, which would not encourage me very much if I were a Russian soldier. Um, I'll give you a different interpretation is that is that they, they weren't really debating the substance. They were debating whether they wanted to announce this in prime time or, or bury it at a different time of day, mm. right? Um, if this were an American politician and he was worried that it was going to be unpopular, right, he would have, he, he would have um, released this in a, in a press release on Friday afternoon of a holiday weekend, right? That's the standard way you bury things in this country. So maybe this was, was them saying, you know what, maybe primetime is not such a hot idea. We don't know though. That, that makes that makes sense. And let's just talk about the specifics of what he said. So the, the words are the partial mobilization of three hundred thousand reservists. And let's use an analogy. Let's say President Biden came on tomorrow and decided to do the same for the United States. What would be an uh, adequate analogy here? Oh boy, I wasn't ready for that question. Um, you know, I, the United States did mobilize some reservists um, for both wars against Iraq. Um, and in some cases, deployed uh, National Guard units. So that's kind of the equivalent. Um, what I think is a little bit different is that the status of the National Guard units in the United States are a little bit different, in which if you're in the National Guard of the United States, you train, you know, generally speaking, one weekend a month and two months out of the year, and you're getting paid. And so you're sort of in a kind of a semi-active status. I think a lot of those units, people in those units were very surprised when they suddenly find out they were going to have to go fight a war. In Russia, this is very different. These are people who might have been conscripts previously or might have been enlisted people previously, but they're out of the military. And their reserve status is really just that, which is if we get invaded, we may have to call you up. So this is a much bigger difference than calling up the the, the, um, the National Guard in the case of the United States. Um, it's much more compulsory in the sense that if you're in the National Guard of the United States, you've signed a piece of paper that said you'll go to war if need be. These guys are done with that. So, yeah, explain beginning. that. So, this is not general conscription. So, this is not like every so single he's person not, he's is. Not yeah. done a draft. He's not done a draft where he said basically, you know, Ukraine has, has a, 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 you know, basically said any male between the ages of 1865 is eligible for service. And they're calling them up as, as, they, as they need to. Um, Russia has not done that. Um, he says, you know, they're trying to minimize this. He's saying it's particular specialties. He said these. He actually said these folks aren't going to go to the front, but clearly they are. Um, so again, they're they're trying to make it sound very partial, but of course, three hundred thousand is not a small number. 
and there was a, um, a an unpublished part of this uh, order, apparently a private part of this order. Um, and the speculation on that is, is when you get into the details, it's actually probably a lot more than 300,000 people. Again, we don't know. I mean, that's the thing, right? This guy could just say whatever number he wants. He can say the lowest possible right. number with the intention. They're actually saying likely closer to a million people is what he actually wants to do. And who's counting here? He, I mean, he's the one who's counting, right? <laughs> like, like, how does anybody else know how many people right. he's actually going to take into it's the draft like, here? He, he, right. He counts, counts <laughs> the, same, the same way he counts votes. Yeah. Um, like, just get the he, numbers right. Yeah. Well, and of course, the way they do this to read is really interesting, too, which is um, – they they break it all down same way they actually do with votes, which is like each jurisdiction is required, right, to supply so many votes for Putin's party, or to supply so many conscripts, and then they push it down right to each each. Um, it's it's like a giant pyramid, and it gets pushed down so that each locality like has to turn up a certain number of guys, and it's almost guys in this case. Um, and so how it gets done in different places is, is going to be really interesting. Among the interesting things is. For the people actually in charge of the conscription, these people are all going to get rich because, among other things, it's a spectacular, spectacular opportunity to take bribes. Um, mm. From from the oh, yeah, people who don't want to be conscripted, essentially, they're paying bribes. And so the people who are in charge of the, the getting yes. the people in the military, they're just going to make money off of this. Yes. Yes. They're, they're, they're laughing all the way to the bank. Wow. And this is another important detail. I mean, first of all, it's interesting. I was reading an article saying, like, the flights out of Russia, there's only two airlines that are servicing, like, Moscow yep. at this point. Yep. They're costing yep. upwards of, like, $9,000, $10,000. First of all, how does the regular person even afford this? Yep. But there are a lot of people paying this money to get out of the country. Right. So, so, so now you get into where, where, where life is going to get tricky for, for Putin down the road. One of the things is people who have money, and this is, look, this was certainly true in this country in the Vietnam War. It's It's true in generally speaking in enlistment patterns in this country. It's not the most privileged people, uh, generally speaking, that enlist in the, in the military. And certainly in the case of the Vietnam War, right, we all know famous, prominent people, <coughs> Donald Trump, um, <laughs> um, you know, George W. Bush, who managed to get themselves out of serving in Vietnam. He was in the Texas um, Air Force, by the way. That was a big deal during the Vietnam War. He was War. in the Texas Air <laughs> National Guard. Well, he did not get that. International um, Guard. Yeah. So, so um, you know, this happens in other places, but it's, of course, it becomes very much resented. And so the combination of basically it, it reinforces probably what a lot of Russians, uh, the resentment they have towards the Russian government to begin with, which is Russians are patriotic. They want their country to win the war, um, generally speaking. But what they hate is the corruption. And so the fact that some people are going to get rich off of this in that people who have money are simply going to either bribe or travel their way out of it um, will increase the amount of resentment. That makes sense. And another thing is that a lot of the areas that are going to be affected here are probably areas of more like ethnic minorities. These, these aren't people outside of St. Petersburg and Moscow that are getting like drafted, right? I mean, th these you are know, people it's in other interesting areas. you say that. I haven't had time to track this down. Yeah. All of the news stories I've read are about folks way off in, in Siberia somewhere. Hmm. Um, but just the way that the population is distributed in the country, it's going to be hard to do it without getting people from all over Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, yes, I think down the road, I would love to see, um, I'd love to see what the geographic breakdown is. I'd like to see the sort of urban versus rural breakdown. And I'd love to see some other things about income, mm -hmm. but we probably won't ever get that data. So we are now talking about a potential 300,000 to a million new troops yep. on the front. It'll obviously take yep. a while to execute. So I anticipate it's going to be happening over a period of time. But this changes the game, right? It changes the game in many different ways. One, well, What is the morale of these troops going to be, though? I, I can't imagine it's going to be that great. So let me, give you, um, let me give you a skeptical version first. And then let me try to give you a, maybe a more optimistic from the Russian uh, a perspective version. The skeptical version is um, they just can't, to say you're going to mobilize 300,000 men is one thing. To do it is another thing entirely. Um, you have to collect them. You have to train them up. Apparently, from what I understand, many of the units in the Russian military um, that are set up to train new recruits have actually been sent off to the front. So it's not even clear who's going to do the training, right? Then there's the question of equipping them. Now, my guess is in terms of light weaponry, you know, Kalashnikovs and, and bullets, they've got plenty of that stuff. Um, but in terms of 
the weapons they're going to use to fight the war, it's not entirely clear either. If you go back to that invasion of Kiev back in, uh, you know, in, in February, March, the problem there was not that they didn't have enough troops coming down from, from Belarus. The problem was they all got clogged up on the roads because the, the, the logistics just became a cluster mess. Mm -hmm. So if you throw another 300,000 troops into Ukraine, can you supply them? Can you feed them? Um, and if you throw them in and their morale is poor and their training is poor, the danger, of course, is that you just get them all killed or captured or that they just get routed and run away. So there's a, um, there's a lot that has to happen between putting these guys on buses out in Siberia somewhere, right, rounding them up and sticking them on buses and having them be an asset on the front in a war mm -hmm. in Ukraine. But Ukraine knows this is coming. It's going to be yep. happening. What do yep. you think their response to this is going to be? How has this changed? And what is the West response going to be yeah, to this? Yeah, this is a good question. I suspect that what I, I suspect the conversations happening in in Kiev uh, today, and probably between Kiev and some of their Western backers, are: um, Does this mean that we need to try to accelerate? Um, our attacks, especially in Kherson, but also in eastern Ukraine. That is to say, do the Ukrainians think um, that we better take as much land as we can as quickly as we can, even if it becomes more costly, mm -hmm. because once you get another couple hundred thousand troops, it's going to be much harder. Supposing we think that the job of these, if these tr troops are not especially well prepared, they probably won't be very adept at going on the offensive, but they might be pretty decent at holding territory. So if you think, okay, the goal of this is just for the Russians to hold what they've taken, do the Ukrainians now need to accelerate their timetable for what they're going to take? Mm -hmm. um, does the West say, okay, if the Russians are going to throw another 300,000 troops on the table, we're going to give the Ukrainians a bunch more weaponry? I don't know. It's, it's to be seen. Um, and, and then... now, let, me, let me give you a, pro, a sort of pro-Russian view, which is, look, if you can maybe throw another three, if right now um, Russia is losing territory because it can't quite muster enough troops to defend the, the lines, maybe you can bring enough forces to bear to turn that in your advantage, and then you're actually going to start pushing the Ukrainians back. Do we know how many people are on the Russian battles, uh, on the battlefield right now on the Russian side? You know, they invaded with, with between 150 and 200,000 troops. Um those are that's a that's a big variance, but it's because it's a question of do you count just the regular Russian army or also the DNR and LNR paramilitaries and some National Guard units that were sent in the so-called Roskvardia, the Russian Guard. So it depends on exactly how you count. Um, the point is, three hundred thousand is a pretty big number in terms of this invasion. Mm -hmm. And how does that compare to the Ukrainian side? You know, we think we think that, and the Ukrainians have, have played their cards pretty close to the vest, um, both in terms of deployments and in terms of casualties. But our, I think our estimates are that their numbers are roughly similar. Um, mm -hmm. Ukrainians, um, you know, we've talked about this before. The Ukrainians have a, have a, a population that's roughly a third the size of Russia's, but of course they have a high level of motivation. And so kind of what the battle here is, and I think the other discussion that's going to be that's going to be happening in Ukraine this week is, OK, do we need to increase our intake of soldiers uh, to get ready for this? Mm -hmm. And as um, well, I think the Ukrainians as a population overall is much more motivated than the Russians to fight. Not everybody in Ukraine is itching to go die at the front. Yeah. Um, I know I know plenty of Ukrainians who have, you know, they're mostly people my age who've not yet just gone and signed up and said, OK, I'm going to stop being a college professor and I'm going to go get my ass shot off at the, at the <laughs> front. Um, <laughs> if push comes to shove, my guess is they will. Yeah. And as we said from the beginning, this is existential for the Ukrainians. And so it makes a lot more sense that every single, you know, eligible male is going to take up arms to to fight against this. But, you know, from the beginning, it's also very much on the Russian side been Putin's war, even though there has been a lot of you know, support quite possibly. We just really don't know how much support there has been on the Russian side. That's right. And I think, uh, and I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb here, um, but I think that this latest change does two things on the Russian side. One is it's going to make the war less popular in Russia, right? Um, everybody, but wars are always more popular when the costs of fighting them are lower. Um, and especially when kids are not getting sent abroad to fight in somebody else's country. But the other thing, you use the word existential. This war is existential for Ukraine. Um, with this escalation, it's increasingly becoming existential, not for Russia, um, but for Putin himself. Uh, I think it becomes increasingly difficult to imagine Russia, quote, unquote, losing the war 
and Putin retaining power. Yeah, we, we, we uh, talked about this last uh, last but, time as far as like it's not necessarily extension for Russia, but it is for Putin, which comes to our next topic is that it's 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 yep. putting him in a very precarious and risky position. And yep. um, I think it's the Wall Street Journal here. I have said there's no other leader on the global stage other than Kim Jong-un of North Korea who has used uh, nuclear weapons as a threat as much as Vladimir Putin has, and that has only increased in his most recent speech. Um, he did bring it up again. He said, I'm not bluffing. So tell us, is he bluffing? <laughs> Well, you know, um, I, I'm not bluffing is almost uh, always something that's said by somebody who's bluffing. Um, the reality is we don't know, right? Let me read a, a quotation to you uh, from Margarita Simonian, who's like the, the, this great Russian propagandist on this uh, RT, what used to be called Russia Today, RT uh, television uh, broadcaster that broadcasts in English. Um, she said, and she's better, of course, super pro-war. Um, she said, judging by what is happening and what is about to happen, this week marks either the threshold of our imminent victory or the threshold of nuclear war. I can't see any third option. Um, so that's kind of pushing the same thing that if we don't win, we're pushing the button. Um, this is, there's, you know, there's a, a massive literature and it actually goes back to the Cold War days about threats and how to try to make threats credible and how to make threats credible while still leaving yourself room to back out if you want, right? Um, we could do, sometime we should do a whole uh, discussion on on the game theory of of, of this particular Like kind mutually of assured destruction and, and- Yeah, and the game of chicken, right? Yeah. And, the, and the idea is always to make your threat credible, you want to make it harder and harder for yourself to not follow through. And in a way, that's what he's done. And by the way, that's the point of, now of, of rushing with these referenda. Um, in the occupied territories. What he's trying to do, and I don't think it's very credible, and I, uh, but he's trying to make, basically say Kherson, for example, or Donetsk, it's not Ukrainian ter territory anymore. It's Russian territory. So if you attack it, you're attacking Russian territory. And that provides more moral justification to using a nuclear weapon than if you were just attacking your own territory. And maybe it provides more credibility to the threat, right? Because I think, just to give you an example, we'd all consider it more morally justifiable and maybe more credible for Putin to threaten to retaliate with a nuclear weapon if the Ukrainians attack Moscow. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. And so what he's trying to do is he's trying to say Kherson is Moscow. Mm -hmm. Donbass is Moscow. Now, I don't think anybody buys it. And one of the things I ask myself is, who's the audience for these referendums? And I almost feel like it's Putin himself. I was going to like, ask you, who's he yeah. talking to here? I think he's, I think he's, he's the multiple audiences. There's almost always multiple audiences. Um, but I don't really think it's the Ukrainians. I think it's the Europeans, um, who he assumes are a little bit more risk averse than the Americans. Um, and I think that's probably right. He's probably right about that. But I almost think, I almost think that, that his audience is himself mm -hmm. and that he's trying to justify the possibility of using nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. He's trying to make it seem less like the, the work of a crazed lunatic. Um, I don't think he's going to have much success with that. Th this but, was a conversation since the beginning of this war, right? Yeah. It's, it's like yeah. this has come up over and over again. I mean, this is a nuclear state at war. Um, yep. But we, we always kind of judge this, I think, as, as pretty low risk, right? Like this is not, yep. I, I mean, there was no need to do it. There's all sorts of other things yep. that Putin could do before this yep. ever came to bear, yep. right? Yep. yep. But, but now, now as he's potentially backed into a corner, are we, are we this much closer to the doomsday clock hitting midnight? I think we are. Um, I, I mean, I still think it's a, a, a low, you know, uh, likelihood. But it's more than it was a couple of weeks ago. Um, I mean, I think we, I still think, of course, there's any number of things of, of escalatory steps between where we are now and there. There's conventional weapons in, you know, uh, in Kiev. There's blowing up hydroelectric dams. There's a lot of stuff that presumably, if he were a rationally rational person trying to signal increasing resolve, he would do all of those other steps before he got around to nuclear weapons. But I think the message he's trying to send is um, 
I am not, I, I, I am not going to lose this war. And I cannot lose this war. And so he, what he is doing again is um, trying to, I think, essentially uh, get to some extent the Ukrainians, but especially the Western Europeans to think, right, for, for those actors to get some urgency about ending the war. Mm-hmm. And that, of course, will make them make more concessions. This is all part of a bargaining process. It's all part of a bargaining process. How much of Ukraine is he going to end up with and what else is he going to get? Mm -hmm. What do you see as the best case scenario over the next month in regards to Putin? Like, like, like what could what could potentially happen that resolves this conflict? I mean, if, if it's even resolvable at this point. You know, uh, the, the, unfortunately, I think we're to a point where we're, where we're, and we've been this way really since the beginning of the war, but even more so now, you're hoping for some sort of miracle within Russia itself, right? You're hoping that, um, that, the, that the Russians, that the, the front collapses and the Russians just stop fighting, and that the response on that in Russia is for a bunch of people to say to Putin, look, you, either you got to end this or we're going to end it for you, Um Again, I don't think that's that's very likely, but that's kind of what you're hoping for. Is that realistic? I mean, like, how realistic no. is something? I mean, like, let's say the people rise up in the streets. What 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 happens to is the people around him, the people he's surrounded by? I don't think people are going to rise up in the streets. Um, and I think there's a lot of history to indicate this kind of regime doesn't go down because of street protests. It goes down because of a palace coup. But what would precipitate, I think there are two things at this point that could pre- precipitate the palace coup. And I want to stress, I think we're a long way off from this. Interesting question, which is more likely the palace coup or the drop the nuclear weapon? I don't know, but it might be that when we're getting close to one is when somebody the decides. The palace coup happens because of that. The, the, yeah, yeah, or he decides to throw the nuke because he's worried that the war is going so badly that it's going to be a palace coup. But the two things that could drive the palace coup, one would be, yeah, he's going to drop a nuclear weapon and, and the rest of the guys say, okay, sorry, this is, you know. He may not value his life, but we value ours um, or our kids or our grandkids. But the other one is, uh, and I think we, we edged a long way towards that this week, is people in Russia who are Russian patriots saying to themselves, this is a disaster for the Russia that I love, right? These are not people who are necessarily Democrats who are even anti-Putin or anti-nationalist or even anti-war. They're pro-Putin, they're pro-Russia, they're pro-war, but they think he's making a, a mess of it and, and that he's, it's got to be stopped. Um, you know, kind of the way that a lot of even, even people who were conservatives in the United States got towards Vietnam by the early 1970s, mm-hmm. which is whatever I thought in 1965, we got to get out of here. Yeah, but, but, but the difference is, is the information that these people are getting, right? So they, they might see it on, you know, maybe their, their family member, I mean, around them, their friends, whatever, mm-hmm. but... The information channels, everything else, is just pure propaganda? Well, so there's you, there's a lot of propaganda. Um, but these people have access to enough stuff. There's a lot of interesting stuff said on Russian Telegram channels. That's sort of, you know, uh, a social media uh, platform there. But especially in the elite, people use VPNs. They, they get access to um, – I don't think the average run-of-the-mill Russian is using that technology, but a lot of the you know, people who are educated mm-hmm. in the elite are. Um, the bigger issue is this, Sarish, is that um, – you can't propaganda your way out of the troops just leaving the front, right? What eventually sunk the Tsar in World War I was troops literally left the front and just started walking back, uh, you know, to Russia or walking back home. I don't think we get quite the same thing this time. But to the extent that the, that the morale of the troops gets low enough to the point where people just say, I'm not – I'm just going to retreat at this first sign of danger. And that seems to be what was happening in, in Kharkiv last, last week. That's the danger is that the troops just don't do it anymore. So it doesn't matter what Putin decides to do because mm-hmm. he's pushing on a string mm-hmm. to use a metaphor. Well, well, That's gl- the danger. Uh, I'm glad you brought up uh, World War One. I. I mean, famously, I mean, the, the czar, um, the, the entire family yep. was uh, was taken out. But also Germany yep. shipped back uh, Vladimir Lenin into into yep. Russia. Right. And, yep. and, and the revolution uh, yes. uh, happened, the, yep. the most famous revolution. Um, where, where is the opposition in Russia? You know, famously uh, over the past few years, Alexei Navalny um, yep. what, uh, become the kind of this figurehead. Um, obviously, there's Gary Kasparov here in the United States who's, who's making a lot of noise. He's been he's been you know saying these things for years and years and years. But but you know, is, is there any hope of any of these figures 
going in and being like, here, here's what we can do. <laughs> so let's remember that the, the, the revolution in 1917 took place in two very distinct steps, one in February and one in October. And the February revolution was not Lenin and the Bolsheviks, right? It was the Tsar abdicating in favor of, of well, first his brother, and then a provisional government that was continuing the war, right? Um, it was only after, and, and it was really only because that provisional government insisted on continuing the war that it eventually fell um, as, as well and was replaced by the Bolsheviks. It left like a power vacuum, essentially. Yeah. So the point that I'm getting at here is, um, again, I don't expect a, um, an anti-government force to boot out Putin. If Putin gets booted, it's going to be his military, his generals, his, it's going to be the people who have the capacity to pull something like that off. And what will be interesting is when that happens, is it a group of generals slash secret police people who think we've got to get rid of Putin so that we can double down and win the war? Or is it a group of people who say we got to get rid of Putin uh, because it, it, it's time to, to, uh, to, to cut our losses. And that's anybody's guess. It, it remains to be seen. It's going to be one of yep. the most significant things in history, in recent human history, yep. uh, whatever happens, however this plays yep. out. Um, yep. And uh, as this develops, obviously, we'll continue having uh, conversations going forward. Thank you so much, Paul, for the insights today. And we'll continue next time. You're quite welcome. All right.